taken from Notorious Nazi Women, by Stuart Dandel. Wana Barman. The Woman with the Dogs. Wana, aka Johanna, Borman, was born on 10 September, 1893, in the Birkenfelder municipality in Germany, though at that time it was East Prussia. Growing up she was known to have been deeply religious, but due to the era and the passage of time, not much more is known about the intricacies of her upbringing. On 1 March, 1938, Wana Borman left her work as a missionary and joined the SS, taking up work in the first women's concentration camp at Lichtenberg. She was initially employed in the kitchens. When the notorious Ravensbrück concentration camp opened in May of 1939, Bormann was transferred along with the rest of the staff and inmates, though that wasn't the only change. By the time the camp was up and running, Wana Bormann had now been handed the position of guard, officerin. In the spring of 1942, Bormann was relocated to the Auschwitz concentration camp in Poland, before being moved on yet again in October, to the Auschwitz-Birkenau section of the camp. This was where the prisoners for the gas chambers were kept. By the year of 1944, Bormann was yet again relocated, this time to the small satellite camp at Hindenburg, before eventually coming full circle and returning to Ravensbrück in January of 1945. In March of that year, Bormann accompanied a death march to Bergen-Belsen, where she remained under the supervision of Joseph Kramer until the camp was liberated by Allied forces. Once captured, Wana Bormann was arrested and remanded into custody at cell. She would remain there until her trial. The Belsen trial as has been mentioned earlier, was held in Lüneburg, Germany, between the dates of September 17 and November 17. 1945. The trial itself, was conducted under British military law. In total, four military lawyers made up the prosecution, and all of the accused were to be tried together. Sitting in a large open dock, they bore numbers on their chest to make identification easier, which is an interesting turn of events considering the identifying marks the SS had placed on the unfortunate victims of the concentration camps. Wana Borman wore number 6. Unlike how the SS had treat people at the concentration camps however, the prisoners in this case had rights, and one of those was to legal counsel. In Borman's case, she was represented by Major Monroe, whom she told that her plea was not guilty to the charges of committing war crimes. During the trial, many allegations of Borman's cruelty would be heard. One early allegation came from a Jewish woman named Annie Jonas, from Breslau, now Rocklaw. She stated that Berman would attend roll call and point out the prisoners who she believed were too weak to work, for the benefit of Dr. Joseph Mengele. The selected detainees were then sent to their deaths in the gas chambers. Another lady of Jewish descent, Dora Schofrin stated that she had come across Wana Borman many times during her imprisonment at Auschwitz. On numerous occasions she said that Berman would select the prisoners for gassing, alongside a Dr. Klein. Dora also related to the court, how she had witnessed Borman set her dog, which she believed to be a German shepherd, on a woman in her work detail. The woman in question had a swollen leg so as unable to cope with the stringent pace of the forced march. After the woman had been viciously savaged by Borman's dog, she was taken away on a stretcher, though it is unknown whether she survived the unprovoked and uncivilized encounter. After the incident, Dora testified that Juana Borman seemed self-satisfied with what had happened, appearing to be proud of her cruelty. An inmate from the camp at Bergen-Belsen testified that during the 18 months that they were held in detention, they had seen Borman set her dog on weak and defenseless prisoners numerous times. They also went on to testify that on one occasion, Borman had beaten her and several other women after they had lit a fire in their hut without permission, furthering this statement by alluding to the fact that Borman was feared by all of the prisoners. Another witness from Bergen-Belsen, Peter Macker, 
stated that he had recognized Borman as the woman who was in charge of the pigs. He stated for the court that he had seen Borman twice beat women for stealing vegetables during the month of March, 1945. One particularly vicious attack occurred after Doris Silberberg tried to help her friend who was ill. When Silberberg told Borman that her friend was too ill to work, Borman punched her in the face so hard that it knocked out two of her front teeth. Not only that. Borman then set her dog on the ill friend, who was knocked down and savaged by the animal, which then dragged her round by the leg. The woman would later die from her injuries. A further witness, Mrs. Suitawa, said that Borman would beat prisoners if they wore their better clothes. She also said that Borman would strip them and make them carry out strenuous physical exercises. If they couldn't keep up with Borman's demands and began to grow tired, she would then beat them mercilessly with a rubber truncheon or wooden stick. Soon it was time for the defense and Major Monroe brought one of Borman before the court to give her side of the testimony. Borman told the court that she was merely a single woman trying to earn a living, and gave them a detailed work history of her time at the concentration camps. When she was asked by Major Monroe whether she had participated in any of the selection processes for gassing, she replied, No, I never have been present at these selections. I had to be present at morning roll call and night roll call, but at nothing else. Next up, she was asked about her time at Balson and whether she had owned a dog. She duly admitted dog ownership at the camp, but countered that the canine in question, was actually a much-loved pet rather than an attack dog. She furthered this argument by denying ever setting the animal on prisoners, and told the court that it would have been against camp rules if she had done so. If she had, she claimed, she would have been severely reprimanded. Interestingly, Borman also went on to mention another female guard by the name of Cuck. Apparently Cuck, of whom there is no surviving record, bore a striking resemblance to Borman and also owned a canine companion. Two other witness statements that claimed of Borman attacking with a wolfhound were dismissed by the former SS guard, she told the court that she had never owned such a breed. Borman then proceeded in her defense to dismiss some of the witness statements, on the basis that she wasn't in the applicable places, at the applicable times. One such instance, was when she had been accused by Ems Copper of being the most hated guard at Birkenau. The court had been told that Borman had been in charge of the clothing store at Birkenau, and that she had set her dog on an inmate there who had gone on to die of her injuries. Juana Borman stated for the court that she had not been in Birkenau at the time of the alleged incident. Throughout her defense, Borman denied having ever left the camps on work duties, or having ever beaten anyone with weapons such as sticks. In her claims, she stated that the first time she had seen a Robert Runchen, was when it had been in the hands of a British military policeman who was guarding her cell. Borman did however, admit to working in the piggery at the Balsam camp and also to slapping prisoners who had been insolent, or who were being disobedient. When asked about the numerous witness statements against her, and the amount of what she claimed were spurious allegations, Borman could offer no reason besides the aforementioned guard named Cuck. In Major Monroe's last deliberations for the defense, he asked Borman if she had ever tried to leave the SS. Borman stated that she had handed her notice in writing to her Otter in 1943, but it had been turned down immediately. It was now time for Juana Borman to be cross-examined by the prosecution, which was headed by Colonel Backhouse. Starting lightly, Borman was asked if she had been any worse than the other female guards, did she believe herself to be more evil? Borman replied that she was unaware of whether she was worse than anyone else, but that she only ever worked to keep necessary order in the camps. Colonel Bockhaus then proceeded to get into the main focus of the accusations, starting with her presence at the selections for execution. In response to his question over whether she attended any, Borman replied, I do not have time to attend them, 
and I did not like the idea of attending them. Further to this, she stated that she had never seen a selection, never mind participated in one. Borman also denied ever seeing any of the crematoriums. Switching tack, Colonel Bockhaus then pressed Borman a little more on the allegations surrounding her violent use of a dog. In her response, Juana Borman stated that the animal was a pet and a pet alone, that it had never been trained to attack and wouldn't do such a thing. Colonel Bockhaus then brought before the court, the testimony of Erta Ellert, another accused Nazi guard. In Ellert's statement, it said, From my own knowledge of Juana Borman and from working with her I believe that the stories about her brutality to prisoners are true, although I have not myself witnessed it. I have often seen the dog which she had and heard she used to let it loose on prisoners. Although I have not seen it I can well believe it to be true." Borman replied with the inference that the statement was nothing but a lie. Moving on, Colonel Bockhaus asked Borman about the pigs at Belson, the ones she had admitted to being in charge of when the camp is liberated. Pointing out that the pigs were well fed and were considerably well looked after, the colonel asked why then, were the prisoners starving? In her reply, Borman could only say that she provided the pigs with the food she was given for them. Finally, Borman was questioned over the reality of Wolf's Harin and Cuck and her lack of record. With little remark coming back, it was implied by Colonel Backhaus, that Cuck was unlikely to exist. Of the two charges that everyone at the Belson trial was charged with, Juana Borman was found guilty of those that took place at Auschwitz. Before sentencing was to take place, the court allowed for mitigation from the defendants. In Borman's mitigation speech, Major Monroe put forth the image of a lonely, frail, sad, and desperate, middle-aged woman. Trying to further paint a picture, he asked those in the court, to take into account what the conditions in concentration camps could do to weak human nature. Although well presented, the mitigation in Barman's case was unsuccessful, and the verdict on sentencing was given on November 16, 1945. Translated into German for the defendants, the sentence given was, Toad Durchden's train, death by the rope. Alongside Elizabeth Valkenrat and Irma Grease, Juana Borman had been sentenced to death by hanging. Apparently dumbfounded at the result, Borman was taken back to her cell at Lüneburg Prison, where she decided against forming an appeal of the verdict. Once the other cases and sentences had been reviewed, Borman was transferred to Homelin Prison on 9 December, 1945. Here she would await the finality of her sentence, with the other war criminals who had been condemned to death. In her final hours, Juana Borman was described by Albert B. Repoint as looking old and haggard, apparently limping as she came down the corridor to be weighed before execution, the weight used as a guide to provide the length of rope for the drop. She was just over 5 feet tall and weighed 101 pounds. Whilst on the scales, she said to the executioner in German, I have my feelings. The drop for Juana Borman was calculated at 8 feet and 8 inches. On Thursday, December 13, 1945, at 10.38 am, Juana Borman was hanged at Homelin Prison, in accordance with her sentence for war crimes.